Hey, hello, everybody, and welcome back to an exciting episode of Security Matters. We are in the Think Tech, actually, I'm not in the Think Tech studio today, uh, but uh, nor, is, nor is my guest, but we are live. And uh, my guest today is Antoinette King. She's coming to us from Access Communications. Antoinette, thank you so much for taking some time to uh, share your, uh, your wisdom with our industry. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be with you. Cool. Yeah, we have some fun on here. So um, typically what I do is I get our guests to uh, just kind of introduce themselves, uh, maybe uh, talk a little bit about your history, what got you uh, into technology, into security, and then sort of bring us up to your uh, current role at uh, Access Communications. Yeah, so um, I am one of the very few people that actually uh, went to school for security. I have a bachelor's degree in managing security systems. So I started uh, my degree program back in the mid 90s and I got some education on um, the IT side of things as well, because back then my chairperson was smart enough to understand that convergence was going to happen, despite the fact mm. that the security industry was all analog at the time. So I got my MCSE back when Windows NT was the uh, operating system of choice. So I'm um, dating myself a little bit. Uh, shortly after that, it went to Windows 2000 and, uh, and I kind of let it expire because I wasn't taking all eight tests again. But uh, yeah. from there, I worked for an integration company called Total Recall, and I was their, one of their first technicians. And I did um, you know, installs for them, mounting cameras, building head ends, programming. And that's kind of where I got um, the basic foundation of security uh, for myself was, was at that job, being an installer. And, after um, I got pregnant with my first son, I was about six months pregnant on a ladder with a tool belt. I was working at the Statue <laughs> of Liberty and one of the guys says, hey, listen, you might want to turn that in. <laughs> so unfortunately, awesome. I had to hang up my tool belt. And uh, from there, I kind of segued into sales and operations. And most of my career was spent uh, in the integration side of things. So I worked for a couple of different companies uh, throughout the years. Uh, just prior to working for Axis, um, um, just about three years ago, I was working for an integration company called Linstar, and they're a New York-based company. And that was my first experience in outside sales. And that was uh, when I realized that, you know, I wanted to do something a little bit bigger, um, have a little bit more influence, and Axis called, and you answer the phone when Axis calls. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> That's awesome. um, about a year and a half ago, I recognized that there was a huge knowledge gap uh, between physical security and cybersecurity. And so I started pursuing my master's in cybersecurity, and I'm four classes shy right now of obtaining my master's in cybersecurity policy and uh, risk management. So now I've kind of found a new passion. Um, Security was never a job for me. It's always been a calling and cybersecurity and physical security is now kind of the direction that I'm trying to head at this point. Well, you're an industry leader in that you recognize the cyber problem. Um, we've we all witnessed it, you know, the last half decade, I think we've seen the industry wake up um, some faster than others, obviously. Uh, congrats on pursuing the masters. I love, I love that passion to continue to learn. You know, it's a, it's um, it's something I wish more of us did. We have, I think, a, a t kind of a top-heavy industry sometimes where, you know, the folks that have been there, they know what they're doing, and they sit in these chairs, and they stay there forever, you know, and, and they're not continuing to learn. I think that's a problem. So um, we'll look forward to seeing what what, what else you bring back to Access. That should, that should be a pretty exciting place to work. Um, so you do uh, key accounts over there now. Is that a – so that's customer-facing, it sounds like, and then do you – you still get to integrate, you get still get to solve integration issues for those clients? Are they Fortune 5 or what's the, what does that uh, entail? I guess? Yeah, so Access is um, three tenants for key account managers. Um, first of all, yes, we're end customer facing. We never sell direct, but we really want to be able to influence technology decisions from a C-suite level. And so uh, accounts that qualify for a key account would be one that would cover multi-year, multi-million dollar, and multi-region um, Okay. Aspect. That's awesome. Yeah, I saw a presentation uh, last time I was in D.C. Um, it was put on by the FBI. It was a coordinated presentation, but Axis was there helping. They're doing a smart city rollout for um, New Orleans. And so the New Orleans team was there, and some Axis folks were there, and then the FBI was there helping. That was really cool. And that's a, that mentorship's necessary. You know, the practitioners are 
in need of um, sort of unbiased, you know, hey, here's how you can do that, you know, ways to solve things. They really don't know. Um, so that's that's important. Do you, um, do you get out um, yourself? Do you like work just in New York? Do you work nationally? How's that, how's that work? No, no, I'm uh, very lucky. So basically the accounts that I work with are uh, traditionally headquartered in New York, but they are global and national accounts. So I do get to okay. work closely with them and, and influence um, national and global rollouts. And in answer to your question before about um, if I get to help with integration, that's kind of the best part of this job. So my, my role is to really build a team around the end customer. And that involves not only Axions, that's what we call ourselves, by the way, uh, not nice. only Axions, but also our partnerships within the industry, right? So VMS platforms, access control platforms, because Access really truly is an open company. Um, we, we love to work with the best in breed. And so that is one of the fa my favorite parts of what we do is to be able to form these relationships, uh, build these teams around our customers, and then uh, watch these solutions come to life. That's awesome. So what's hot? I mean, like um, you're, if you're getting, those are big accounts. So I would think they would have a lot of interest in, you know, the, a, a broad variety of topics, but, you know, SIA put out its mega trends. Of course, cyber was number one. So you're right on point for that one. I think facial recognition was next, which kind of heads down the surveillance path and the privacy path. But what, um, so what kind of, what are you seeing? You know, what are, what are they knocking on your door for today saying, Hey, can we, can you help us with something? Oh, it's all about the analytics. Come on. That's uh, everybody's uh, favorite. Analytics, yeah. analytics. Yeah. So everybody's interested in analytics. Um, you know, what can we do with our surveillance cameras that can add value to our business uh, proposition, right? And a lot of the customers that I work are uh, mostly in retail. Uh, I do work um, some also in the banking industry. And so money's tight and they're going to be spending money on cameras anyway. How can we use that technology to improve the bottom line, to improve customer experience? Um, you know, not just for loss prevention anymore. And so it's really about big data. What, what information can we get? How can we use it? And then how can we drive our business in the direction that's going to create more revenue? Yeah, I mean, that seems to be the topic of the, this, this gathering of data. We're pumping out pet, petabytes, right, with, through all these cameras daily. And, and it's, I guess, hitting a, a data lake, right? So you've got this storage capacity going on that's growing and growing and growing. And what, what are they wanting to mine? I mean, what, can you give me an example of like the, you know, I know there was like queuing was a good idea. So you don't have to have so many lines open in a bank if there's no one there, but when the line gets long, you got to make sure customer service is high. So, you know, analytics for like queue lines, I, I sort of understand that one. What else is, um, what else is the industry throwing at you? So um, from, from kind of a, a retail perspective, um, line queue is a big one, but also loitering. So if somebody is spending ah. an exorbitant amount of time in front of a display, they're tr probably doing one of two things. Either they're confused about their decision on what they're going to buy, or they're trying to steal something. So we can utilize <laughs> a loitering yeah. analytic to uh, find out, you know, if somebody's standing in front of something for, let's say, a minute or two minutes, whatever the predetermined amount of time is, um, trigger an announcement for a, an associate to come and help them. Number one, it's going to make those good customers feel like they matter and they're important. Mm -hmm. um, the people that are maybe there for other nefarious reasons, maybe they won't come back to the store for that because they realize that they're being watched. Um, we also, you know, I deal with a lot of uh, high-end retailers that have very, very expensive merchandising, but because of uh, uh, aesthetics, they don't want to necessarily put them behind uh, a case or something. So we can I also see. use the analytics to see if something's been removed, objects been removed from an area, um, or we can create a, uh, you know, uh, some sort of barrier in the area to make sure that if somebody crosses that barrier immediately, an associate will come and try to help them. Yeah, that's awesome. There's, um, retail seems to have taken the lead. I know uh, the financial sector as well, but retail surely has the, uh, um, I think the, a, a lot because they're they're at that point of sale, right? So at that decision time, and that that if that's driving more revenue for them, the use of an analytics valuable. Um, are you seeing that? Are we edge deploying analytics? Are they moving? Are, are they so large that, that we've got to put them back? You know, in the chassis, or is, are, are, is it a hybrid? I mean, that's the customer has to be confused about where to where are we going to run these analytics. 
Oh my gosh, this is an awesome question. Okay, so yes and no. Um, yes, we can manage a lot of these analytics on the edge, but uh, when we start getting into things like facial recognition and and uh, you know heat mapping and those kinds of analytics, there there's not enough processing power right now at the edge to manage that. So depending on what the end customer is looking for and how much data they're trying to mine, um, that would really be the determining factor as to whether or not they would use an edge analytic or they do something that was built into a chassis. That's awesome. Do you get um, pulled into, so the, I can understand that this, the deployment is this, the security team, right? But the data side of the business, who are the folks that you work with on that side of, you know, like in a retail, like a, a large retailer, do they have folks dedicated that are like, are, are they data managers or I don't, I don't know what the title may be. Yeah, so it, it depends on, on the organization that you're working with, but um, a lot of times it's marketing dollars, right? So, oh. you know, us, we as security practitioners, we really want to talk to this, you know, chief technology officer, the security officer, um, but we're really not branching out into those other parts of the organization. But if you think about... Um, Retail end caps, for example, they charge the manufacturers of those products for the end caps. If we can use an analytic to prove that oh. people have a tendency to go towards this end cap then, rather than another, um, they can actually drive mm. revenue with that analytic to charge more money for that end cap. So we really need to be talking to people um, all across the organization, not just uh, in the security side of things, to, to manage these solutions on a, a much broader scale. Wow. Are those, um, are they long-term or are you finding that, that retail is open to using analytics and they're trying these things out and have been using them for a while? Or are you getting yeah. sort of like greenfield opportunities for, for corporates that haven't done anything yet and they don't, you know, they don't even know how to start? Yeah, I think, I think it's a, a lot of newer stuff, right? So everybody's kind of getting their feet wet. Um, one of wow. the things I was just recently at NRF and uh, everybody, I mean, there were a million different companies out there that are doing analytics um, specific to retail. And there's a lot of different dashboards. And one of the things I'm finding from um, several of the customers that I'm working with and engaged with is that they don't want to use a, a dashboard for everything. They've got a dashboard for their security stuff, and then they've got a dashboard for their retail analytics. And that's where things are starting to get uh, muddied a little bit. And I think uh -huh. that they, they, there's a lot to grow into. Um, we're going through this growth pattern right now, understanding the information that's required, and then how can we um, you know, get this in information together in, in one common dashboard. So I think that's really um, been a little bit of a challenge. Mm, that's good. Well, I, I'm glad that our industry's working on it. We need to be part of a broader solution. That's for sure. We've been saying that for years and Convergence is going to let us do that, hopefully. Um, we're about midway through. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll pause for a break, a one minute break, and we'll be right back with Antoinette King. Hi, I am Yukari Kunisue, host of Konnichiwa Hawaii, Think Tech Hawaii's Japanese program, broadcasting every Monday from 2 p.m. I usually invite a guest in Japanese language community who does interesting things, and I'd like to share stories with you guys. Please tune in and listen to Konnichiwa Hawaii. Aloha, y'all. My name is Mitch Ewan. I'm from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, and I'm the host of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We're on every Wednesday at 4 o'clock, and we hope that we have interesting uh, guests who talk to us about various energy things that are happening in Hawaii, all the way from PV to windmills to hydrogen, close to my heart, electric buses and electric vehicles. So please dial in every Wednesday at 4 o'clock on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Security Matters. We are chatting with Antoinette King. And it's really amazing stuff you're doing over there. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I don't know if all businesses are aware that there are um, subject matter expertise inside these companies. So if you're watching and you've got some questions about how to do these things, reach out to some of these companies that have subject matter expertise in these areas and teams that aren't trying to sell you things but help you develop solutions. I think that's so important. And for you, what an opportunity. It's got to be fun. 
No, it really is. <laughs> I'm definitely living my best life right now. <laughs> awesome. That's all. That's good. Every day. That's awesome. Um, so we were kicking around before that episode a little bit about women in security. And I know our uh, women in security forum from C is up and running. We've got a few hundred members now. I was an honorary invitee to try to help um, help more men uh, with that with the discussion uh, around women in security as, as if we need a discussion at all. But um, I know you're you're deeply engaged with as is is women in security. Um, tell us how that's going. What the size is? What do you how, how do you feel uh, things are happening with that organization? Yeah, so what's really nice about um, ASIS is that uh, there are a lot of practitioners. So SIA uh, is a lot more on the manufacturing side and the integrators, but with um, ASIS, it's more of practitioners. And so I'm really lucky to be involved with the Global Council uh, in a couple of different uh, form factors, but the one that I'm most proud about is actually uh, the Publications Committee. So the Women in Security Global Council created a Publications Committee to give women uh, an opportunity to get published. So many of us are um, either in school or went to school uh, or doing training on various different subjects within our industry, but don't have really a platform to get our, our um, information out there. And so last year was the first year that we had the committee together and we as a group, um, there's a handful of us, created a white paper on um, in creating an insider uh, risk program. And that was really awesome. exciting because it was the first time that I was published. Um, so nice. I'm kind That's of good. one of the people that got to use the opportunity. Um, and now we're we're kind of opening up to various different subject matters so that women in our industry um, ha can have their voices heard. Yeah, and we need that. I mean, we uh, we were talking before how there's every voice matters in security because I think that there's so much knowledge out there and so many problems have been solved that other people, if they're not aware that they've got, you know, that there's a solution for their problem, and it may just be that they haven't talked to someone about it or haven't heard. So getting Getting these voices out, getting them published is, a, a, I think, a super worthwhile effort. What is the uh, the driver there? Did you guys just decide to start writing or did you have a, some guidance from as is? Because, you know, they publish a lot of, um, obviously, their documents for their, for their various certifications as well. Yeah, so um, it really is a push from the inside out. And um, the committee was formed prior to me getting onto the committee. So I don't know necessarily exactly how it originated, um, but I just do know that it was very newly formed when I jumped on board. And, um, you know, they we're really, really um, in line with the ASIS principles. So sure. the white paper that we wrote was kind of in the same format. And that's kind of where we're going in the direction with that committee is, is, you know, as a, an extension of ASIS. What a great resource is, is the, uh, is it a, a, a publicly available document once you get it published or does as is own it and sell it? Like, you know how they have prices for their, as is membership price is, is cheaper or whatever. So tell me a little yeah, bit about no, the, it, how, that, how it goes publicly out. Publicly available document on the website. Awesome. Um, we, we have a, a section of the website specific for women in security. And so it's available mm -hmm. online there. And uh, also on my LinkedIn, if you'd like to just get a copy of it, it's posted there as well. Yay. That's yeah. awesome. So um, are you going to stick, are you guys going to get like multiple uh, uh, topics in one document this year, you think, or, or just try to maybe keep some subject matter expertise so in, in different areas? Yep, it's right going to be a series right. of mini papers, right? So we want various different ah. topics and, and we, we don't necessarily just want to focus on, on diversity, right? We want to hear um, what the practitioners have to say and what the subject matter experts have um, to be able to, to provide content out to our industry. Awesome. Are are your um are your uh I guess what I say the the did you get more requests from after you published that document to to do to speak or to get you know to get uh the you know did the did the women that were engaged with that paper get more um I guess industry exposure you know beyond the paper itself. Absolutely. Um, I definitely think for me anyway, I can speak from my personal experience that being engaged not only with the committee and not just having that paper published, but being engaged with the Women in Security Council um, at ASIS and also within SIA. Um, you know, we have this tendency to talk about the good old boys club in our industry. And, and yes, that does exist. Um, but I've just seen in the last six to 10 months, um, a real push to have more diverse 
groups of people within these committees um, in both organizations. And I, I've been invited to be on a couple of different um, committees, one being the ethics and the other cybersecurity advisory board on SIA as well. Because for me, you know, women in security is great and it's a really important cause, but I want to be a female in the industry that has a voice on various different subjects within our industry. And so, yes, I will always be a champion and advocate for diversity, but I also think it's important um, to practice what you preach. And so we can't just have a women in security council. Um, we have to have more women on the other councils and the other committees and the other working groups so that there are diverse, um, there's diverse input for all those other subject matters. Yeah, and I mean, as we as our industry matures, which is what it needs to do, right? We we, we need to mature that that outlook. And I don't know how we got so male heavy, unless it was just because they were ex cops and ex military, and that that's what was in in police and military, you know, law enforcement, military, you know, thirty years ago. And w was that all men, and they all came into the security industry? Because it it seems awful lopsided you know to me when i attend events today you know and there's the it's great we i think the awareness is out there now I've, i see many more men are i think willing to be mentors and willing to you know there's it's kind of a who you know thing they got to share their contacts introduce people around get people uh, engaged with each other and, and sort of pass those relationships on uh, i guess is the best way to put it you know there's the number of influencers is large but you, you got to have a way to get to them and to know them right and to be become known um, what do you think about our, our panel presentations and all this stuff? I've been pushing really hard to not accept them unless there's, uh, at least one woman. I prefer 50% uh, women. And so these, these idea of mantles, you know, we got to get rid of all these, these guys <laughs> talking all the time, you know? So what, what, what can we do to help there? Give me some ideas. <laughs> Well, honestly, um, when we were at the first time I met you, which was at ISC East, and you talked about that at the uh, Women in Security Breakfast, oh. I, I was so excited to hear that. I mean, that, that's such a big deal, right, to have that kind of a mandate to say, look, if you're going to participate in something, you need to be the driving force to make it a more diverse um, panel. And I think that, you know, again, we need to go back to the fact that it's not just diverse in, in gender, right? We need diversity across all lines, across, yeah. you know, between age and, and culture and race, yeah. um, because that's really when we truly get good input. Um, it's, it's something that every company just has to take seriously. I know at Axis, they do a lot of training on, on, um, con unconscious bias. Um, we talk, mm -hmm. we have a, diversity committee. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of different things that we try to work on, but still even at that, we're nowhere near the numbers that we should be in terms of um, diversity within our own company. And we really champion for, for uh, diversity. We've, we had a women in security summit, you know, internally uh, last year for our company or actually in 2018. Um, but it really is just a matter of understanding what it means, what diversity means, and then pushing for it. Um, sometimes it's easier to take the path of least resistance. You know, mm. we're going to get more male applicants in this industry because typically in a technology driven in industry, that's what you get. You just have to work a little bit harder to look for other candidates and perhaps even in other industries. Um, I was lucky mm. enough to have been brought in from the ground level, you know, from my education, uh, through my college, but we need to get, you know, closer to the young people. I think that's the, really where we're going to be able to do it. The millennials are going to drive this. They really are in, in all industries, not just ours. Sure. Do you think we're open enough? Are we friendly enough industry once people get to know us or are we the, you know, are we our, the shoulders crossed security group that's too stodgy? We're not, uh, we're not fun or, or whatever it may be. I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's a really tough question. Um, I've been in this industry for 20 years. And I am going to tell you, up until I worked at Axis, I was in, very intimidated oftentimes. Um, ah. uh, you know, Kelly Bond talked on her when she appeared on your show about uh, when she went on, uh, you know, her first trade show, you, you know, 20 years ago, and there were very few women. I can't tell you how many times, um, even, you know, up until maybe five years ago, where I was asked if I was a booth babe. You know, because people yeah. just do not see women in technology as subject matter experts. Um, I was just recently at NRF and was telling my story to a customer. And um, when I mentioned that I was a technician, he was like, what? 
you were a technician. And so people, I don't think he meant it like maliciously, right? Yeah. But yeah. he sees me, I'm dressed in a skirt and heels and, and you know, got makeup and jewelry and all of that. And it's hard for him to envision me as a technician with work boots and a tool belt. And so, yeah. but that's really <laughs> all goes back to those unconscious bias. It's just, it's, it's yeah. what we see when we think about security professional. So, um, yeah. you know, it, we all kind of have to take a, an active role in, in changing our own mindsets. We need more images of like when you were six months pregnant up on that ladder. We need those <laughs> images out out in the in our media instead of yeah. guys doing something, right? You know, we've we've got to do that. We have a superstar a female installer on our crew that all of our guys like to work with because she's that good. That she they all want to learn from her. And I, I think it's epic. I wish I, I um I'm obviously a champion uh, for women in this industry in every role. I, I wish I wish we had more women just insecure. I wish they understood how valuable our industry is. You know, there's, um, there's, there's roles for, for women all throughout this industry. We need to, we need to create those roles. And I don't know if they're going to be created from guys finally retiring. It seems like when you get in this industry, you never stop working. I don't know how many sure. people are in their seventies. I'm like, don't you want to retire? Like make room for other people, you know, but uh, security <laughs> people, I think they have a passion for it. So they just keep doing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know what? Um, yes, we do need to, to create roles, but I think we, we have to go deeper than that because the majority of women in our industry are currently in marketing and HR. Um, there are, a, and we're, we're a very close knit tight, tight group of women. And, and when you start working the circuit and you start going to these panels, you're going to see there's a lot of repeats of security practitioners, women that are in this industry because they are far and few between. And so I, I think it's incumbent on all of us to just um, get, like I said, get to the young people. Uh, technology is a sexy industry, but people don't usually equate physical security and the technology, but we are getting yeah. into AI, we are getting into machine learning, cybersecurity, all of those things. Um, I'm also a member of the Women in Cybersecurity organization. And um, it's that's another type of organization where I'm trying to get women from that sector to look at security as a viable yeah. option for them within their you know uh, career path with cybersecurity because we need them. Yeah, we 100% we do. Um, we're about out of time, Antoinette, but I want to congratulate you for all the work you've done uh, on the master's degree as well. Uh, I look Thanks. forward to seeing you at the next show. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll be at ISC West or something. Um, maybe a closing closing thought for our audience, if you have uh, just one, one thing you'd like to prompt them with. Well, I just think that um, in terms of technology, be on the lookout for, for AI and machine learning, but also just learn and understand what it means. Don't just take it for face value. And then in terms of diversity, um, make it your own mission, uh, not just women, but but all across all different uh, segments. We just have to see more difference in people. And appreciate it too. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Uh, that's all we've got for today. We'll be back next week. Aloha, everybody. <laughs>